Hello and welcome to Vox Markets. I am John Hume and I'm delighted to welcome back Stephen Tredgett of Oakley Capital Investments, the uh, listed private equity investor. How are you doing, Stephen? Very good. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me back on. No problem. Well, we, we spoke a year ago after your uh, your trading update last uh, last October and uh, you've just put out a trading update again. And, and it's very positive stuff. But the market is horrendous. Um, so perhaps you could start by, first of all, reminding us what Oakley, Oakley does, uh, and then we'll come back to, to kind of your recent performance and, and what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to remind you, Oakley Capital is a private equity manager. Oakley Capital Investments, or OCI, as we refer to it, is the listed investment trust that invests in the funds managed by Oakley. What does Oakley Capital do? It is It, it manages a number of strategies, but largely it's a pan-European um, buy out private equity manager so it's investing checks up to kind of 10 million to 300 million in in small to mid to mid size private companies what do we care about we care about three four sectors technology education consumer and um, business services the theme that runs across all the deals that we do that they kind of has to be growing they have to be profitable, but there's probably kind of four main themes that we look for. One is that we found a lead. That's that's the kind of our secret sauce is that we have this incredibly strong network of founders that we've backed not just once, but up to four times. They invest in the funds. It means we fund a lot of deals off market, away from very competitive auctions. And we had to be investing alongside them. So their equity has to be going in at the same kind of value as us. And we are completely aligned. The other thing is that they typically are digitally disruptive. So we're looking for companies that are doing something different in the market so they can capture market share rather than rely on market growth. That typically leads to some kind of recurring revenue, or at least we look to try and introduce it. And then finally, the last two things is that we want to be investing behind one of a few megatrends, that business shift to the cloud, consumer, cliff to, consumer shift to online solutions, um, and the growing global desire for high quality accessible education and then finally as is often the case with PE we're looking to be able to create some value ourselves so that so that we can affect the outcome that is often in 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 buy and build but it also can be in introducing more senior management and talent it can be around improving the quality of earnings etc mm. um so so I mean one of the questions I was going to ask you is what are the characteristics of the companies you invest in because that that's really what's driven, you know, what is a, a very strong performance, um, a, a, as you've reported in your recent trading update, in what has been a very difficult market. You perhaps talk us through how that's translating into, into performance, um, you know, and a nav that, that continues to grow, despite what's going on, you know, in, in sort of broader economy and, and across the markets. Yeah, so what is, I mean, the average, the last time we gave you an average EBITDA growth of the portfolio, um, it was about 20%. Um, so, uh, you know, at the very least, it's kind of average double digit earnings growth. So that is the thing that is majoritively driving the valuation of these of these companies. Um, how are they achieving that? Well, that kind of goes back to that point that these companies can't rely, at least we've, in our investment thesis, we've assumed that we are acquiring these businesses in a recession, that we can't use a huge amount of debt and we can't guarantee multiple expansion, i.e. selling them for a higher multiple than we bought them we have to rely upon organic growth and if you look at our realized returns since inception 60 60 to 70 percent of our realized returns have all been thanks to organic growth debt which is a topic we might not get onto one percent of those returns so 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 that has to be the thing that we that we have to have high conviction in and and it's it's the view that what do we mean by digital disruption you know, let's take, for example, price comparison of a very um, mature market here in the UK, where we're all familiar with money supermarket, compare the market, etc. Um, and you know, things like car insurance, you know, 90% now are done online. There are plenty of European countries where that kind of penetration for those solutions is still incredibly low. I often quote it, but let's take Italy only 40% of Italians have done any kind of e-commerce of any kind, which is incredible, even post-COVID. Take a vertical like car insurance, less than 20% of that is arranged online. 
So when you ask me kind of how do you how do you grow despite the kind of macro environment? Well, we own the number one price comparison website in Italy. We are not making a bet on the Italian consumer. We're not making a bet on more, you know, more cars, more car insurance, or you know, the mortgage market, whatever. What we are making a bet on is two things. One, that the penetration of that kind of solution is going to grow, and it has grown. That business has grown 20% every year for the last 10 years and continues to do so as you slowly see a shift to, to online solutions like this. Plus, in the current market, consumers are actually more, are more price sensitive. And so they start to use things like price comparison or cheaper digital alternatives, as they often are cheaper, mm -hmm. as in real estate agents using property portals more than, you know, kind of high cost TV and other media advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, one of the other sort of mega trends <clears throat> that, that that you haven't mentioned, and and, and perhaps is you know it's it's relatively new. It seems to have really sort of hit hit the uh, hit the mind of the market this year is is AI. Um, so obviously, you know, this is the big tech theme. Lots of excitement about it. How 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 are you factoring? You know, is it something you're interested in as another digital overlay? How is it affecting that you know you're thinking about the types of company you invest in? Yeah. I, I noticed yeah. you recently bought um, uh, Pixis or invested in Pixis, an AI-powered marketing company, for example. Yeah, you, you can't have a good investment discussion these days without mentioning <laughs> AI in some shape or form. I mean, let's take you through our thinking. One, this is a massive paradigm shift for the you know for many many companies, particularly those service you know service companies. One, it is a threat and an opportunity too. So, you know, our 28 portfolio companies are all being asked to heavily review what the impact and opportunity is in AI. Mm -hmm. How are we addressing it? We basically wanted to bring a team into Oakley who, you know, this, 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 is, this is something beyond our reach and sadly, you know, kind of our intellectual powers. I mean, we, we needed people that had invested in this space for kind of many, many years. And that's what we've done we brought a team in um, who, who sits under the kind of Oakley Turing brand. And these are guys that have worked for Microsoft, for Qualcomm, SoftBank, who have backed, you know, kind of many ent you know, enterprise software businesses and AI-backed businesses. So that's where our in touch power, and they are working with each of the underlying portfolio companies. And we've launched a fund so they can, can invest in this next generation of opportunities. Mm -hmm. We're quite proud that at Oakley we um, we kind of did well with the with the advent of the smartphone, and then the next kind of chapter after that in terms of cloud computing, and we kind of feel that this is the kind of the next in that kind of <clears throat> chapter in kind of technology advancement. So so we think there is you know kind of great investment opportunities there that we want to grasp, and as an OCI investor, you now get exposure um, to that investment. So in terms of if we, if we took the existing portfolio and in ways in which they're grasping AI. I mean, the most obvious example is IU Group. It's um, one of our largest holdings uh, in the funds and therefore in OCI. Um, it is an online degree university. It's, the, it, it's German based. It's the largest and fastest growing university in Germany, but it's now very much an in international proposition. It has degree awarding powers in uh, Germany, UK and Canada and probably 25% of its student intake each year is now international. That's the background on it. So where, where does AI come in? So most of the tutoring is done um, remotely um, and they launched over the last couple of years an AI um, tutor. And the, and the interesting thing about this and also kind of flags up what's so idiosyncratic about how education happens today. As you and I know education, it's let's put as many people in a lecture room or a classroom we'll talk at them you know kind of a number of times um, a week over the course of a year and then we'll test how much they remembered at the end of the uh, at, at the end of that year um it's very counterintuitive as to how we learn we all learn in very different ways we all learn at very different paces we all learn through different mediums um and the best thing in order to judge people's understanding is discourse is to speak and understand where they are in their appreciation of subject, very much in the way that traditionally, you know, was the, so you know, the, the, the Socrates method. Mm. And what we're finding incredibly with an AI tutor 
is one, the students ask at least three to four times more questions of an AI tutor. They are not, they're not so inhibited in what they reveal or don't reveal. And as a result, the AI um, <clears throat> teacher under, learns a lot more about the underlying student. It learns what they understand and what they don't understand, what materials they respond to better. Do they prefer pictorial, oral, video uh, versions of things? And also the frame, you know, how to frame some information for the students so they best understand it. This particular student is most interested in the manufacturing industry. Brilliant. I'll frame the answers in terms of the manufacturing industry. I also know that I not only just answer this question, but what I can give them is follow up and adjacent information that will help boost their understanding in areas I don't maybe think that you know they truly understand. It is a much more effective and proactive method of, of teaching. And it, it's going to be, it is clearly the way that students are going to want to learn, the most effective way for people to learn. And that's just, I'm taking education, for example. There are lots of ways in which the portfolio companies are embracing AI. Yeah, <clears throat> genuinely trans transformational. And, um, I, I think it's possibly the best example I've heard of AI and education. I think generally the, the worry has been students will get chat GPT to write their essays, but, but obviously there's a, there's a lot more to it. Uh, that's, than that. And that's the flip side, isn't it? That is the flip side. There are challenges. Mm, mm. Absolutely. And, you know, for schools and, and physical in classroom schooling, particularly pre university age, then I completely, you know, we completely understand that there is a whole bunch of challenges that we have to navigate. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you're in a good position to, to to support that that transformation, that that change. Um, let's perhaps sort of head back to head back to the markets and uh, and the impact on uh, on Oakley Capital. Well, one of these sort of enduring uh, features of 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 the market this year has been uh, the fact that uh, we've seen big discounts across the investment trust sector as a whole, but particularly uh, private equity based uh, investment trusts. And I think that's perhaps reflected some nervousness about valuations, but. You know, look, looking at your your latest update, you know that nervousness seems misplaced. What 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 is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, this is the million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, I think there's a couple of things to to, to kind of reference there. I think firstly, let's talk about where the market is in terms of its um, sentiment at the moment. Um, and I think there's kind of three phases we have to work through, particularly if I look at my own perspective of kind of talking a lot about listed investment trusts. Um, and the PE sector. And I think we're in the second phase. So the first phase was very much last year. That was 2022, post COVID. We saw the big public markets sell off. We saw the tech companies valuations correct kind of post COVID after their, you know, kind of boom through that period, probably just returning to, you know, kind of, uh, kind of in line, you know, longer term valuations. And of course, the big concern was that there was kind of um, volatility laundering from the private equity funds, and there still is, um, and that they were you know, kind of holding valuations high. As a result, there was no belief in the, in the net, net asset value. There was no belief in the valuations um, that PE firms were holding their, their companies at. And that really was the theme of last year. How can you demonstrate to us when it's hard with a limited amount of visibility for us to really appreciate if you're holding these companies at the right valuation? Hmm. I feel this year, that's less the theme. The theme more this year is very much, okay, your NAV is probably robust, but there's two other things that kind of concern us. Can you actually grow that NAV in the current environment? And what's the impact of debt? Like, are you over leveraged in, the, in this kind of higher for longer interest rate environment? Is that going to cripple your ability to make returns? And that certainly reflects the kind of, the, a lot of the questions that I am receiving at the moment. And I'd suggest that. That, that's the phase we've got to kind of work through. Then next year, my argument would be is, you know, one, proving that there actually was conservative evaluation, that we can continue to make returns despite kind of higher debt environment. And we're, we're for example, 70, 80% hedged across our portfolio. And that you're going to start to see growth like we've demonstrated, you know, kind of this quarter. And, and as lots of the listed PE um, are, are starting to kind of demonstrate growth. So I think that's the that's where we're in terms of market sentiment. And I think I'm certainly not holding too much hope that there's going to be a, and there's good reason for that kind of, you know, negative sentiment. And I, I'm certainly not expecting any, you know, kind of turnaround in sentiment this year. 
but I'm reasonably optimistic for next year because I think you've got to allow, you know, investment trusts and listed PE to work through a couple of quarters to kind of help grow that kind of confidence so that we see that coming through. Now, why are the discounts is kind of related? Well, I think it kind of comes down to three points if I if you're happy for me to make those. So, Absolutely. So that so that so I think it comes down to kind of th three three areas: liquidity, transparency, and performance. And this is the same in any in any kind of time within the markets and any kind of sentiment. And so what what do I mean by those kind of three? Um, liquidity is this point that it, the sell-off's indiscriminate at the moment. And that set-off is down to the fact that if, you know, there's been outflows from the market now for quite some time, they're generally speaking, the lower, the small mid-cap end of the market suffers. Generally speaking, most investment trusts are small to mid, they're kind of sub a billion. And as a consequence, I've not looked at the latest stat last time I looked of the 16 AIC investment trust sectors, 14 of them are, are, are at a discount. So you know, this is market-wide. It's not mm. PE. I'd argue it's not even investment company. It's small and mid-cap. I mean, if you speak to any fund manager and you've spoken to a number of them, you know, their frustrations around valuations at the moment and the lack of buying in the market is, is pretty much whether you're a small mid-cap manager, mid-cap manager, or an investment trust focused manager. So, so that has to that has to change. And of course, you get this compounding effect. If you are not sold off initially and you hold up as a, as a listed entity, then the fund manager who's, who's everything else has fallen and they've had to kind of sell because they've got um, outflows, they have to sell you because you come too big in the fund. And so you're going to get hit one way, one way, one way or another. Um, so, you know, the, the larger we get, the more liquid we get, the more backers we get, you know, that will be one of the ways in which ultimately, I think, one of three ways in which the discount starts to close. The other key thing is transparency. The reason why everyone focuses on discounts is it's quite hard to look at some of these companies and go, do I truly understand what the asset value is? You know, in some cases, they're fund of funds. They might back to 100 managers. They might be up to 1,000 companies. How do I take a view? It's, it's, it's very hard to, which is why the fund of funds trade on bigger discounts than the direct PE. Because at least with direct PE, you're backing one manager. That's one, you know, one broad kind of consistent strategy. And in many cases, like with OCI, you can see the 28 companies we're invested in. You get a trading update on each of them. We explain the average multiples they're being held at, the average growth rates, the average debt that we've, de we've deployed. And you get, you know, kind of increasing transparency. As a sector, I would say, we have come on leaps and bounds in that transparency. Um, and the more that we can reveal to the underlying investors, there's a bit of a oxymoron, isn't it? You've got private assets that are public. <laughs> We're trying, you know, there's benefits of being private, information advantages that you want to retain. But that to one side, I think the more that we can be transparent and allow people to have a better judgment of the underlying portfolio, the better. If there's one event that I think should have been a bigger deal in, in the market at the moment, in terms of that kind of transparency, is there's a number of things that kind of give you extra transparency, isn't there? One is when you sell an asset. Did you sell it below, at, or above the NAV? The NAV. Now, in periods of lower activity, you see less exits, so you get less confidence. Now, that, that exit activity has actually started to pick up, I've noticed, across the sector over the last few months. And we've seen exits again at premiums. The other really, really telling thing, HG sold down some stakes in some of the underlying HD funds. So HGT sold down. And it did that in NAV. And that's quite compelling. If you can literally sell your stake in the funds at NAV, and so someone has done the analysis for you, maybe the analysis that you can't do, a big secondary fund has come in, done the analysis of those funds, and is willing to take large stakes from a, on an off HS, a, a, HGT at NAV. That should have been the biggest headline news for any listed PE. Um, analyst or, or, or anyone writing in the market because that's a transparency that you rarely get and it's a new wave of confidence if there is now this growing secondary market and sorry, sorry and this is I've gone on a bit too long here performance it's ultimately what drives drives shelled returns increasing belief in performance will mean that 
you know, increasingly you'll get, you'll, you'll move closer to the, to the nav or above the nav. And if we take the obvious examples that are the biggest, the best performing and the most transparent investing companies, they trade at the lowest discount. I mean, the most obvious example is 3 in 3i. Yeah. It's very liquid. It's very big. It's transparent because you know all about action. You've got, you know, it's a big chunk of what it's focused on. Um, and it's got one of the best performances. And funny enough, it's trading at a premium and has the best shelter return. Ourselves and 3i are in a similar boat. <clears throat> uh, sorry, HG, best shelter returns because like 3i, uh, we've got the best, um, um, we've, we've had the best um, nav growth over the last five years. Um, and that should always be the focus is nav growth. That's what drives shareholder returns. And the thing we have less control over these discounts, they've always existed, but they're going to narrow for, for certain of the investment trusts as, as we continue to perform. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, in terms of, in terms of performance and, and, and future performance, I guess one of the, one of the main factors behind that is, is, is investments uh, and continuing investments, and you've been very busy uh, on that front recently. But perhaps talk us through some some of the uh, the new investments you've made, some of the sort of uh, additional investment you've put into to some of your portfolio companies. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you'll you'll see you'll see similar themes um, across these. Um, we recently invested in a dental lab business in in um, Northern Europe, um, Germany, and Holland. We've invested in a a hosting business. We've we've acquired an asset out of a listed entity in Australia, um, and recently we've just bought um, or agreed to buy a stake in a logistics software business. They would seem like three very different businesses. So so where's the kind of similar themes that we you know kind of we set out here? One, they're they're founder led businesses. Or, or we have a, a founder group that we can put into those businesses. Secondly, they're in relatively fragmented markets. For example, we take dental labs. No one's ever really consolidated a dental labs business. No one's looked at the opportunity to create um, um, scale. Um, and that's the opportunity we see across all those three opportunities. Um, the other six significant thing is the way that tech is disrupting these businesses. In web hosting, it's either driving the adoption of more web hosting, naturally, as people move, shift more to the cloud or online solutions. And the other opportunity is you're looking at the way in which logistics is being disrupted by software or technology is changing the improving the margins for labs rather than constant back and forth with a dentist, you know, who's kind of taking photos and measuring, you know, kind of people's teeth with, you know, in, into oral scans now. You can actually get a 3D model of a mouth, which is much easier, much more straightforward and much less um, lab tech time required now to produce the solutions for that. Um, and so you've got kind of tech disrupting markets where we think can either grow business, grow business for, for, for companies um, or it can increase their, their margins. Um, and so we've got three businesses that are very much in line with that um, with the Oakley thesis. And also the fact that we've just done three deals in the last month, is kind of um, gives you some indication of what's happening in the wider, wider market. One, activity down the smaller end of the market is relatively high. They can't grow with debt anymore. There is a disrupt, there's disruption in the market, which fans want to take advantage of and do m and um, They see a growth opportunity and they need either capital or a partner um, to help them do it. So our pipeline looks incredibly strong at the moment maybe counterintuitively mm. and also it if you look back historically the vintages that follow kind of macroeconomic disruption tend to be the best best performing vintages you, you've actually preempted my last question which was are, are you seeing more opportunities as a consequence of the state of the markets um so you've answered that but i guess my next question is you know <laughs> you, you, you know what, what's your position to take advantage of that like you know what what how much dry powder are you sitting on yeah we're very we're very fortunate i mean this links to oci so we we have li literally just raised three funds so the next vintage of three of our funds our flagship fund which does mid cap private equity buyouts our origin funds has just closed 750 million which um, does lower mid buyouts and locally touring 
which is the AI venture kind of growth tech opportunity, all of which have just raised or closed funds this year. And OCI has committed to each of those and also has its own cash pool kind of ready to go to deploy into that. So we're incredibly lucky with that timing. Our performance has been such up until now that we've, we obviously attract a lot of attention from investors, public market and private mm. um, fund backers. And um, we just happen to be kind of well poised in a period where, you know, companies are, as, as I've already described, either kind of eager to do, you know, to do activity, or of course, they've got the wrong capital structure. You know, they're very highly lev levered. The underlying, you know, the underlying owners have to find a solution for them and they need equity. And so we've got, there's kind of our dry powder <clears throat> to make those deals and to, and to, and to kind of, <clears throat> take out the debt that's kind of crippling some of these businesses and also, you know, kind of help them to kind of grow and, and kind of do m &A. And then we're really fortunate that sitting in the large cap global P funds is still a trillion of dry powder, believe it or not, that needs to be deployed. And of course, they're less likely to be doing very big um, private company deals because of the cost of debt and because those companies don't tend to be high organic growers. They are looking to come down to large, mid, where there is organic growth, where we've got companies that we've grown to that size, and ultimately, you know, we'll look to sell to those kind of owners. So, so we're kind of on the right side of uh, of of um, both those drivers at the moment. Yeah, <clears throat> no, but it sounds very much like it. And uh, uh, as we said, the, the portfolio itself is already showing that it's it's on the right side of where um, where, where the market trends are taking us. Uh, Stephen, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure talking to us. Congratulations on what has been a very you know strong period. Uh, you know, in, in, in respect of where, where the markets are. So uh, th thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Thank you.